Why, hello there. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, my name is Mr. Dogbot 333 welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, the New Order Last Days of Europe as Mexico. The last video we started trying to get things put together for the DFS crisis coming up. What do we got here? Um, Industrialists. Yeah, they really prefer Salinas. Um, it's actually not that big of a gap. Uh, we're doing our best to try and get our influence up for Madrazo. It's a bit of an uphill battle, I'm not going to lie, but... I mean, what are you going to do there? Um, other than try to figure out. What we can do. Industrialists. Intensify negotiation efforts. I think that's probably a good idea. We'll do that. Uh, meanwhile, um, get some reading to do. About Stu Puebla, formerly known as Iroca Puebla de Zaragoza, the capital city of the free and sovereign state of Puebla, is one of humanity's oldest still standing planned cities. Located on the path from Mexico City to the vital Atlantic port of Veracruz, the city of Puebla called itself the reliquary of the Americas due to its storied history and varied architecture. With the Mexican Baroque Cathedral sitting on the grounds it, of the starkly modernist Universidad Iberoamericana, it is a, certainly a deserved title. For those less familiar with Mexican history, they will know Puebla Bass of a site where over 2,500 elite forces of the Second French Empire were defeated by 600 Mexican soldiers on the 5th of May, 1862. Jesus. Didn't, didn't realize it was that. A date that has eternally celebrated in Puebla and suburban, in suburban American cookouts as Cinco de Mayo. Did I read this already? I feel like I have. I think I have. Am I running out of uh, unique cities to read? Montejano. Oh, shit. I have to go back here. Scroll back up. Let's do these two. I don't think I've read these two. Uh, let's start with Leon and Guanajuato. Leon is the most popular city of the state of Guanajuato. It's, well, not the capital. The state capital of the city holds the state's municipal seat. Leon was occupied by French for three years and celebrated the, the visit from Maximilian I in 1846. Multiple people were wounded by government soldiers during the city's liberation. One well, century labor, later, a group of so students were killed for protesting the election of Bonifacio Salinas. Salinas. Wait a second here. Leon is known as the footwear capital of Mexico. The majority of the country's shoes come from the city. Foreign investors have shown interest in the city's potential for industrial expansion, but only time will tell the Pearl of Bajo, Bajo will become known for more than leather. And we also have Salea, up among the mountains of the state of Guan Guanajuato, sits the city of Salea. The head of the Salea municipality, Salea was established in 1570 by Spanish settlers. It's long played an important role in Mexican history, given its strategic location of the Bajo. Bajo. See, during the Independence War, it was later attacked by the French during their invasion from Mexico, and still further by Porfirio Diaz during the coup in 1876. He even saw one of the bloodiest battles of the revolution, as in 1915, the armies of Pancho Villa and Alvaro Obregón clashed in a horrific bloodletting. In the aftermath, Salea was left as a wasteland with little hope to recover. And yet, it always, as it always has, it grew from the conflicts of the past to embrace the promises of the future. By the 1960s, the city has bounced back as its recovery turned into an economic boom. Coupled with its strong infrastructure and commerce, giving its placement in the Bajo, it is becoming quickly known as the Golden Gate of the Bajo, only further enhancing its growing prosperity. Well, there we go. Those are some foreign policy decisions we can get to now. Um... I want to decrease that. Um... We could mediate with Lopez Mateos. That would give us more political power, actually, in the long run. Same with the to the Veracruz Forum. 
Actually, that would be a better return on my investment in the short term, so let's do it. CHB, barely afloat. Hmm. Interesting. We've lowered interest rates. Alright, now let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and work on... Let's extend rent payments first. The government has taken a decisive step to alleviate the financial burden on those affected in the current crisis by deferring rent payments. This move will afford some, those suffering from the economic fault some much needed breathing space to regain their financial stability. This measure that, at least in the short term, is largely agreed upon within the party. However, this consensus breaks down with the, when questions is asked about how long this moratorium should be extended to extend the future. Unsurprisingly, it's Madrazo and the Cardenistas that seek to keep the policy in place for as long as possible to ensure that most renters have recovered. While the more pragmatic followers of Ordaz are concerned about the cost and impact on landowners that a prolonged period of rent, the less the rent revenue will bring. Ultimately, the success of either option will depend on how well navigates this fine line between economic relief for renters and safeguarding the property market. It's COVID all over again. Alright, um... Rodrigo Alvarez had run away from his home several times as a child. Be lure of the unknown, the independence, though, he would always face harsh reprisal from Josue. The graving would always return. This time, however, he felt as it, it though, was not an option. After a glass-blown job fell through due to the economic crisis, Rodrigo returned home, placed a few centavos in his pocket, and went on its way in search of better pastures. His struggling family needed money, and Rodrigo thought he knew where to find it. Walking was nothing to him. Exhaustion was a small price to pay for a job, and the adventure called to him. As he walked alongside the road to Veracruz, he slept in empty Ejido sheds, drank water from strangers, and stole food when he had to. Hours bled to days as he walked. His eyes finally rested upon his father's hometown, peering at the in infinite blue beyond it from top of the hill. The ocean. He'd never seen it. The port of Veracruz would prove not as fruitful as he'd hoped. Kid, everyone's looking for a job right now. Shoo! We're not hiring right now. Can you not read the sign, boy? No luck. After a week in Veracruz, all Rodrigo had to show of his efforts was denial after denial. He returned to his usual sleeping spot on the beach and peered out long ungly as the sun set, eating a stolen banana. From the sound of a wave spilled his mind, its rhythm soothing his ears. For hours, he took in its, its immensity, counting the ships passing by. He would leave come the morning, not before getting one last look at the gulf. It was a sight he would never forget. All right, uh, Salinas makes some, some more moves. Moves. Uh. Okay, we can't afford to, we cannot fail to sway. The workers we got. I'm not worried about the workers. Salinas has a bit of an uphill battle there. Anyway, industrialists. We could probably get them. If we have from packed commitments. Yeah, yeah, well, actually, that's huge. For Dorado Gutierrez, his company had found the bottom of the barrel. Oh, we could do a new proyecto. Proyecto, uh, the southeast. Um, let's do the Manuel Moreno Torres Dam. The march to electrify the rural south continues in Chiapas. The proposed those Manuel Moreno Torres Dam, located further upstream, the Grijalva River, the mountainous interior, the eight over 800 foot tall embankment dam would only grant electricity to tens of thousands nearby but also grant Mexico the title of North America's tallest dam. Well we gotta do that for our ego if nothing else. I mean come on. Interesting so we could do uh we could build a fort so we get Madrazo win. Funny. 
For Eduardo Gutierrez, his company had found the bottom of the barrel in terms of accommodation in Mexicali. The Jewish Star Hotel lacked air conditioning, which made tonight especially insufferable. Standing in the lobby with two heavy bags, he yelled from the taxi. Receptionist, a hairy, sweaty man in a Salton Sea tourist t-shirt, returned with the room. One bed, one bath. Two months' stay, top floor. It was a good thing he made reservations early, mentioned the receptionist, who took the payment and lazily walked back to a cigar and magazine of a scant- scantily clad woman being rescued from Japanese paratroopers. As Eduardo tried try to lift his bags up the stairs in the sweltering heat, he wondered how full this place could be, possibly be. Obviously, his company skimped out and found the cheapest possible to bunk their engineers while they made millions off this contract. But when he finally got to his floor, he found his boss in the hallway, staying two rooms down. He couldn't believe how lucky Edwater was. He found the hotel. He thought the hotel had been all but bought out by the scientists from the consulting firms. Indeed, Mexicali was completely full. Hotels and hostels were crammed with white and blue collar workers from all over Mexico, somehow displacing the tourists from California. Housing had been bought out by companies who needed places for their workers to stay in the city. Rental units were completely full of people on short term leases. Lots were full of trailers for those who didn't want to wait in the massive line. This wouldn't last ha- forever. Already, more land was being cleared as cheap bunkhouses popped up on the outskirts of a city. Once the brick walls, walls and metal roofs went up, the iron frame bunks were moved in. When the walls of the living area were covered with beds, in came the electrical appliances for the kitchen, the communal stove, sink, coffee pot, and refrigerators. Another company owned home for the working class successfully furnished. But this wasn't only for construction workers, who were expected to leave when the project was finished. This was for what would come after them. Now full of power, from the same foe force that built the mountains around it, Mexico would no longer be a farming town on the border of the U.S. Factories would spring up here like they did in Tijuana, Juarez, and Matamoros. In its own way, this expansion was Mexico being molded by the fires of the earth into a new Maquiladora city. These homes would have AC, though. <coughs> Three production units, that's pretty huge. Increased GDP by 3%. Also huge. Production units. Oh, that'll, yeah, that'll get away in a bit. All right, let's do... A firm pact commitments. Industrialists. Uh, we can improve broadly. We sure pull industrials political interests. We can work broad for a bit. Now, as long as we do that and cut down Salinas' in, in influence, that's really all we need. The big f- issues of DFS. Monitor the paper paper trail. Now let's get let's keep going. Crisis continues. Okay. Look at that, we got the industrialists, not quite the bureaucrats. That's a bit, that's not something we're gonna be able to do. We have eight days left for that, we're not gonna be able to do that. Can crack down on subversive elements though. And I'll crack down on the DFS stuff. Um, three out of four. For Salinas would be good. Get that guaranteed. Um, I 
to get some infrastructure going. Some of these places. Yeah, let's build some infrastructure up. The hour's late, but Madras and Odaz were still awake, discussing with go the government's continued response to the Kabuki effect. As victims of Japanese layoffs continued to pile up, concern began to grow over their ability to financially keep their heads above water. Madras and Odaz had both agreed to the general framework of a potential solution, extending rent payments in an effort to take financial pressure off the Kabuki effect to victims. However, the devil is always in details. We cannot afford to take a weak position on this, Gustavo, Madrazo said, his voice filled with passion and confidence. These workers are not going to be able to just easily pick themselves up and move on from this. We need as much time and assistance as we can give them, and more. If we fail them now, we may never recover. Carlos, I understand your position. I promise I truly do. However, we must realize that the workers are not the only ones in peril here. Who are too generous now, the business community will take further fright. If we cause damage to their bottom lines, their investments will dry up, and these workers will have no employees, employers to hire them. The debate went on. And on, but both men knew the pressures they were under. They needed to act quickly, and a poor decision was better, th far better than no decision. So, after rigorous debate on the details, uh, the details of the rent extension were finally agreed upon. Um, it kind of just looks like it's going to be best to do act with caution after a conservative extension. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, next. Um, oh, we're gonna cut the uh, cutting the rope loose. Japanese corporations that have established a significant footprint in Mexico are currently reeling from the effect, ripple effects of the turmoil that is engulfing their homeland. The severity of the situation is such that most of them are facing the grim prospect of going under unless they receive financial aid from the states. Ordaz and Madraza are quite content with that fact. The money that could bail them out would be much more valuable in helping out Mexico directly. And some of the loss, loss of some Japanese influence will be something to, se to celebrate for many. Madraza will appreciate the weakening of Japanese imperialism, while Ordaz will find it much easier to approach the Americans without the restraint of Japanese interests. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's gonna hurt. That's gonna hurt uh, pretty bad, though. Um, President Lopez Mateo sits with Scallon's office chair, a rare sight for the charismatic statesman, even in times of crises. Just as the effects of Japanese financial crisis are being fully understood in grass, reports are trickling in around an organized protest in the rural central state. Of San Luis Potosi, surrounding certain Salvador Nava Martinez, a bleeding heart firebrand who famously challenged a pre candidate for governorship, losing the 61 election in the state. That rabble rouser Nava cannot just accept a loss, candy. The sly bastard sees the suffering of his kabuki effect as an opportunity for his own political gain. President Lopez Mateos pesters his staffer. The escalating the situation in San Luis Potosi would make sure his final years would see no short ordage of action. What the hell does he even want? Upon skimming the reports and news articles, however, the main demand made by Neville rang loud and clear. Nothing short of a complete overturn of the 1961 San Luis Potosi governor election. Glancing up from the file, the frustrated president leans back into his chair, pinching his nose. Just like Hamarillo, Nava had previously been negotiated with in the years prior, have already having release from prison in 61 after the public demanded as such. We released the bastard or payments and demand to overturn the election? Bullshit. The charismatic presence of Lopez Mateos had built up, and his perceived reputation in leniency was beginning to rear its ugly side effects. The president thought to himself. He turns to his staffer. Keep me posted on this. Well, we're going to go ahead. We'll entrench DGI agents. Increase our preparation. In case we get to a civil war. I'm hoping we don't, but if we do, you know. Oh, for fuck's sakes. President Lopez Mateos browses the shelves of his go-to shop near the Zocalo. A discreet store that w used to be 
that was used to his business. Well, most of the goods have a shorter stock than usual. Okay, so that's locked down. They support Ordaz. Good to know. There's a complete lack of his favorite American drink. The thirsty president made his way to the man running the place, annoy the predicament. No things are hard with the Jap Japanese good ladies, but what about the coal on aisle five? Brown responded. Supply chain issues from Mr. Beard in San Luis Potosi. Something to do with road blockages going up in there. Lopez Mateo shook his head in disappointment and began to reach for his wall before something got both their ears. As if waiting to be mentioned, the radio playing the news and the shop goes on about a massive protest underway in San Luis Potosi, led by none other than Salvador Nava. Reports have said in by students in government buildings have arrived today, who are allegedly accompanied by disgruntled pre-officials. This is in addition to the earlier street protest by the synarchists and rail unions earlier in the week that have brought the state grinding to a... Lopez Mateos tosses the peso onto the counter, storming out towards a car on the street corner in anger. How could this information even make it past the press restrictions? To national radio. Nav and his diverse little gang of dissenters cannot be put off any longer. The president decides. We'll go ahead, uh... Monitor the paper trail. More. He gets in the passenger seat, turning to his driver. Take me to the National Palace. Now. It's only a few minutes away. A cabinet meeting would be convened. Ah, Jesus. can't get a break, can we? Protest Rock, the state of San Luis Potosi, is a former independent candidate for governorship, Salvador Neva, uses the current temporary economic setback to alleviate uh, the populace. Without evidence, Nava claims that he won the 1961 gubernatorial election and demands the illegal removal of a sitting governor for supposed electoral fraud. Based on their seditious slander and violence, many of Nava's collaborators have been charged with the crime of social dissolution by state prosecutors. While federal authorities take ne the necessary action to restore order, His Excellency President Adolfo Lopez Mateos has also magnanimously initiated negotiations with Nava to settle the matter peacefully. Lieutenant of the Secretary of the Interior, Luciano Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, and Governor Licenciado Carlos Alberto Madrazo are believed to be leading the latter efforts. Through words or justified force, this disruption will be brought to an end. Anti priest slogan surrounded Javier as he pushed his way along the crowd towards a police checkpoint. Men and women were pressed in against one another, and the faces that Javier could see were contorted in fury. He felt one man behind him, screaming with such anger that the spit was hitting the back of his neck, mixing with a sweat trickling down. The sun beat ha down hard. There's only one thing hotter than the humid air that choked them, the anger of the protesters themselves. Javier had no time to question things once he was caught up in the crowd. It was not until the crowd reached the checkpoint that he began to regret ever becoming a part of this. There were DFS mixed in with the police, and as soon as they got to the checkpoint, all hell broke loose. The batons came out, slamming into the first row of protesters. At first, the fury of the men and women around Javier held the tide against the DFS and police, but a few, after a few had rifle butts slammed into them, knocking them to the ground bloody, Protesters began to scatter, and when the way opened for them to shove their way into the veins of the crowd, there was nothing to stop them. Violence swept over them like a wave, and Javier was frozen in place even as they came nearer and nearer. His legs felt stuck to the pavement, his breath caught in his throat until the baton of a policeman slammed into his chest and sent him hurling onto the ground. More blows came, a cascade of boot them slamming into his arms, legs, chest, and anywhere else a boot or baton could reach. If he didn't get away now, he would be arrested or worse. Life finally returned to his legs, and as if by providence itself, the policeman beating him was hit in the head by a rock from a nearby protester. His attention diverted, Javier scrambled to his feet and dashed from the nearest alleyway. He did not look back. No money was worth that hell. Yikes. Well, industrials were choosing their side soon enough. I was told I would receive a cash balance. No, please, you, you can't turn me away. I need this money. Javier pleaded with the bank teller, but she seemed deaf to his pleas. He finally stepped aside, letting another of the protesters try in vain to receive their pay from this mysterious benefactor. 
Whoever he was, he might as well have been Satan himself for all heavier cared. Because of him, his body ached from four dozen bruises scattered across his body. His ribs throbbed, and it still hurt to even walk. He had nowhere else to go. Mexico City was still reeling from the riots, and he'd be hard-pressed to find work here besides. He knew there was some opportunity up north, but that meant leaving the only home he'd ever known. He worked at that Mitsubishi factory for almost a decade. He supposed he could find work at a maquiladora up north. At the very least, he knew that he could be an asset. He also knew of those who moved to the U.S. to return to work for a few years, saving up enough cash to start a better life from returning home to Mexico. He also heard that work, the work the Americans put you through was backbreaking. It was a plantation in Texas or California. The Poe's party of the revolution. What a joke, Javier thought. Before he had protested against them, simply because it might get him paid. And now, yet now, he could feel a small fire burning inside him. The fire he had seen blazing through those protesters. He would free, flee Mexico City's home, so that he might scrape by, but he would never trust in the pre again. In his heart, only resentment remained. Lopez Mateos paced the presidential office, his face a whirlwind of ever-changing emotions. Fear ignited it for a time. The Japanese were a fearsome superpower, a real great influence in Mexico, but were clearly not averse to the idea of starting resistance movements against the government. Anger took over in a rapid coup. What right do they have to dominate Mexico so? They should be punished for their abuse of nation's sovereignty. Finally, a cold heart, calculating feeling, maneuvered the, to the head of his thoughts. And he sat at his desk and began to write. Madrazo and Ordaz were rarely seen entering the same building, let alone the same room. And the wounded state of a mutual enemy ensured that the two would have to work hand in glove. Mateos studied them for a moment as each, other eyed, each eyed the other with flashes of contempt and anticipation. Gentlemen, the state with Japan has reached a point where the decision must be made. I've heard reports from Tokyo, the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Mateos tapped a, vanilla, a manila, vanilla folder? That was manila. I don't know. And they aren't pleasing. It's become fairly obvious that Japanese corporations in Mexico are nearing insolvency. I've been advised on of a number of different things. Some call for bailouts. Madrazo and Ordaz both briefly smirked for that certain sum was one of the few people that had earned their mutual contempt. Others called for liquidation. I have chosen to take the more laissez-faire option. We let it be. Ordaz and Mateos leaned in somewhat. Mateos was not known for deliberately taking a finger out of the pie. Mateos began pulling out folders, handing them to the men, each one bearing numerous telltale data points and explanations. If you read these, you will see what the reasons why. If Japan wants to keep doing business here, they should tell their lobbyists to be less brazen, but they're at least never lobby for causes that hurt our administration. <sighs> Nevertheless, I'm sure some will quibble about it. I know this will hurt many workers, but this is a necessary level, level of the playing field. Goodbye, gentlemen. He was not looking forward to telling Salinas the news. The curtain closes on the farce. Alright, so we could purge the gaps. Or fill out the bottom. Um, let's fill out the bottom. The industrials are going to be more immediate. Mexico's industrialists, within and even outside of the pre, are influential and will likely be uncooperative with our plans to relieve our nation's lower classes. However, the Yasuda crisis allowed us to sidestep their usual concerns. Since Japan's companies are in free fall, we can cut subsidies and shift the funds towards solvent companies. Our poorest will receive relief, and our riches will lose nothing. Everyone walks away a winner. Surely, how's our peak? Speaking of poverty, uh, that's worse than what we began, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Yikes. Um, the morning sun beams through the single large window in the conference room of the National Palace, illuminating the Mexican cabinet members, all of which were in attendance, so a rare sight. At the head of the table lies Lo President Lopez Mateos, bringing in the room to a quiet halt after announcing the meeting will begin. I see you have all come here today to address the escalating situation in San Luis Potosi. For that, I give my thanks, as the situation cannot be put off any longer. Pleased to see his cabinet working together for once the aging president's cadence is unbroken. Gesturing to a new face at the table, the president introduces the well-known firebrand of Tabasco, Carlos Madrazo. 
at Odaz's insistence, we brought in Licenciado Madrazo, well hopefully spearheading diplomatic approach with Nava. Man in the room, including Salinas, looked visibly skeptical at the thought of a diplomatic approach. After all, how had it not been taken two years prior when he was released from prison? However, prison cut off any potential opposition. This will be an untandem with Odaz leading police suppression efforts of Nava's movement. With enough pressure and open hand, we should be able to quell this nonsense movement with ease. With small attention, the room is released, and work on the details began. The meeting mostly goes off without a hitch, with respective ministers giving their concerns for the plan. From the potential popular repercussions of suppressing the movement, to the probable economic slowdown that would be caused by transport and eruptions in San Luis Potosi during the crackdown, most of the concerns have been mitigated by the end of the meeting, and most seem pleased. Salinas lies in the corner of the table, however, with his cold gaze directed towards Ordaz and Madrazo. He'd been sidelined this time, but he wouldn't take it lying down. By the meeting's end, a plan had already begun hatching his mind. One of more unorthodox nature. Ordaz and Madrazo will handle this. Well, that's not, uh, it's not ominous at all, surely. Um, let's do some more construction stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and leave things there, folks. But thank you, as always, for watching. If you liked the video, leave a like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you have any comments, feedback, leave them in the comment section below. I read all the comments I get. And I do appreciate any little feedback you might have for me. Check out my various links down in the description box below. Leave any comments or feedback down in the comment section below as well. I appreciate, um, yeah. The sub button for uploads weekdays as well as occasionally Saturdays. That's going to be it for now, I think. But thanks for always watching. My name has been Mr. Dogboat333. I thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye now.